Welcome to uh, another sex seg uh, segment of our Meet the Researcher series. Uh, today, I'm delighted to have uh, Professor Wayne Visser with us, a uh, Chair in Sustainable Transformation at Antwerp uh, Management School and Fellow at University of Cambridge Institute uh, for Sustainability Leadership. Uh, Wayne, uh, I'd like to kick off this discussion just to learn a little bit more uh, about you. In other words, to meet the researcher. Who, who are you and uh, how, how did you um, get interested in this subject of, of sustainability? Well, hi, um, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, today. Uh, I've been involved now in the sustainability game for over 30 years, pretty much my whole career. And what happened was uh, I was studying business and I got involved uh, in some uh, organizations and conferences uh, on sustainability and business because it was the time just leading up to the first Rio Earth Summit, which uh, took place in 1992. So it was really in the air and I got, uh, I got passionate about it right from the go. And then my career, I just tailored towards that. I, I, I still did some general management consulting for Capgemini, but then I, uh, I specialized with the masters and uh, then set up and ran KPMG's sustainability services for a number of years. And then uh, ever since I've had one foot in academia and I'm still uh, advising business that's why I call myself a pracademic. Um, uh, another question related to that is, um, uh, I noticed from, from your bio, you were born in Zimbabwe and you grew up in Cape Town and um, your literature is, a, uh, is peppered with kind of uh, examples of, uh, uh, and um, illustrations of, of um, of, for example, apartheid. Uh, you've mentioned even just uh, swimming in uh, near to Cape Town. Uh, how did how did that influence you in terms of your position in terms of uh, looking at sustainability? Well, I think in two ways for sure. I mean, one, I was very fortunate to grow up. I was born in Africa, grew up in in both Zimbabwe and South Africa, and. I spent a lot of time outdoors. I mean, I, I got involved in the Boy Scouts. We were always hiking and camping. And so I developed a love of nature very early on. But at the same time, we had these two societies actually going through an extraordinary transition from essentially racist uh, governments to democracies. And, you know, it took me some time to to really wake up to the fact that uh, this this battle was going on all around me but uh, in in university it was actually an economics professor who finally opened my eyes to to show that uh, you know this was a completely morally economically and socially bankrupt system that we were part of and so bringing in that sense of justice became part of um, of course, the wider sustainability agenda and the interests I ha had already, which were more environmental to begin with. So I think it definitely shaped my um, my sense of ethics and justice and the belief that we can never separate uh, environmental issues from social issues. And funnily enough, we see it now again, don't we, with the Black Lives Matter movement and you know, even when I've written about that and posted on LinkedIn, I've still had reactions from some uh, some people saying, you know, this really shouldn't be part of the sustainability agenda. And I'm flabbergasted by that. You know, uh, justice and, and ethical issues are always central to sustainability. Yeah, it's an it's an interesting comment you make. I'm I'm uh, well, I'm I'm in Israel right now, but I'm I'm based uh, uh, mainly in Nigeria. And when we talk about sustainability, um, what we're really talking about is access to the labor market and to uh, and to and to jobs uh, and uh, you know considerations about air pollution uh, can only be you know those direct uh, the the direct you know cause of, of plastic burning and nothing related to, to, to the earth heating. So it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's, I think, a very meaningful point. Um, I guess I, before moving to the research, I have one 
question uh, that you touched on uh, in, in, in introducing yourself around what you call, and you talk about sort of working in the world uh, with one foot uh, in, the, you know, the business world and one foot in academia. If you could tell me a little bit more about the tension there of, of wearing those two hats and where there's actually a, a beneficial, a benefit of, of, of working in those two spheres. Yeah, it, it was a bit of a, an awakening for me because when I when I started out with Capgemini, one of the global management consultancies, we we quite regularly consulted with leading academics to to really push our thinking, uh, and then we would turn it into models and uh, and methodologies that we could use with clients. And I thought this must be normal. And then uh, when I got into into academia a bit more, I realized that was the exception. Most academ academics really are caught in an ivory tower and are not really working a lot with business and not applying their knowledge. So um, I think there is a tension uh, in, in practice, in, in companies. Uh, it's very short term. So they do a lot of research as well, of course but it's very uh, snapshot research and often very superficial and probably misleading because they don't really understand the pros and cons of different approaches to research. Um, and then on the other hand, academia, the, the strength is that you have time to reflect, to really go deep on subjects and to design research in a very thoughtful way and uh, analyze in, in an interesting way. So now most of the roles I've had, both with Cambridge and with Antwerp and, and other universities I work with around the world, uh, I choose them specifically because they are very applied, very facing the market and rather working with companies. And uh, that, that's how we now structure uh, the, the research I do, which I, I guess we'll get on to, but it's typically working with companies rather than in isolation. Thanks. Yeah, that it's, uh, it's indeed a tension, but it sounds like you've managed to uh, uh, find the best of both worlds in, in, in working with it. And, and thank goodness for organizations, for, for uh, CISL, um, to, to try and, and marry uh, academia and, and the business world. Um, and I think well, as we move to the topic around the, you know, that you're focusing on and nowhere uh, does it matter more than when we're talking about sustainability and, and the circular economy, uh, these kinds of partnerships, because uh, it, it does require a kind of all hands on deck response uh, to the world's most urgent problems. So I'm going to move now to, to talk about, uh, well, to ask you to talk about your research. Um, and, and you've uh, you referred us to uh, both a paper and a and a documentary that you've worked on, uh, and the paper is called uh, "Creating Integrated Value: uh, From Systems Thinking to Sustainable uh, Transformation in, in Business," uh, and the documentary is called "Closing the Loop." Um, maybe. Uh, if you could first begin by sort of introducing uh, both of these uh, uh, publications uh, and, and the thinking around them. Sure. Well, the first thing to say, of course, is that uh, research never emerges from a vacuum. So uh, integrated value, which is what I'm quite focused on right now, uh, built on many steps that came before where my research was was focused and so I'll just briefly mention those and for those interested they can they can go more into that but I started out very much interested uh, in corporate social responsibility and especially in developing countries and did some work on that there's a paper I I, I did that has become quite uh, referenced which is uh, uh, looking at Archie Carroll's CSR pyramid uh, which looks at uh, economic, uh, legal, ethical and philanthropic responsibilities of, of business and challenging that a little bit and saying, well, maybe this doesn't apply quite the same in developing countries like Nigeria, which I've also visited several times, and that the order of that pyramid, if indeed that's still a good framing of CSR, uh, would probably be different with uh, 
yes, economic, but philanthropic playing a much bigger role um, than um, you know the legal and ethical, the weakest uh, components. And in the ideal world, probably wanting to even flip that pyramid where ethics or governance should be the the basis of the pyramid, uh, and then things might go better in those developing countries. So there's a whole stream of work around that. And then based on my uh, my experience, I, I got quite frustrated with CSR to to say that well, quite frankly, that it's it's failed and is failing. And I established uh, CSR International uh, with the idea of trying to transform CSR. Could we make it something that is uh, not used simply to um, to greenwash or to uh, to put a, a friendly face on the company, but really gain society? And that, so I came up with the idea of CSR 2.0 or transformational CSR. And there's a whole book on that, several actually, but uh, the age of responsibility is the most comprehensive one and many papers um, on that. A lot of that is collected still on the CSR International website. Um, but then I think, you know, the the language changes and you have to keep up with that as well. The ideas change. So we saw uh, Michael Porter come out with shared value, for example. Um, there were others before, like Stuart Hart with uh, sustainable value, Jed Emerson with uh, blended value, Ed Freeman with stakeholder value. So you start to notice that CSR, in a way, gets left behind as a slightly outdated concept, mainly because too many companies are still implementing it simply as philanthropy, uh, despite my best efforts to try and reframe it. Um, and so I, I started to realize that we need to also reframe uh, the work and the research, and that's when I came up with integrated value because when we look at uh, a lot of the research and a lot of the standards around sustainability, they're all calling for integration, for a better alignment of uh, the industry or the company you're talking about. Uh, but nobody's really saying how you do that or what that really means. What does integration mean? On the other hand, there is the shift to talk about a different kind of value and that perhaps the problem is that companies uh, and the economy has been destroying certain types of value while building other types. And you saw the integrated value, uh, integrated reporting uh, standard come in, which has the six capitals model. So you get all of these reframings happening. So to, to my, my way of framing it and the research I do, um, for me, integrated value is really ultimately about finding uh, the innovation synergies between uh, different areas of breakthrough uh, in society. And to understand that, we have to first ask the systems thinking question, which is what is not working in society? Where are the areas of breakdown? And so uh, you can read all about this in the paper, but uh, very briefly, there are five areas of breakdown. So disruption, which is all about uh, emergencies and catastrophes and crises. Uh, COVID-19 is a great example. Uh, you get disparity, which is all about inequality in society. You get degradation, which is the environmental um, peace, the disconnection, the technology piece, digital divide and discontent, which is uh, the lack of health and safety piece. And for each area of breakdown, then you have uh, whole areas of the economy which are bringing solutions, the breakthrough of them triggers transformation leading to these economic spheres. So you get the resilience economy, everything to do with reducing risk. You get the, uh, the sharing or the access economy that's creating a more inclusive uh, model for society. You get the circular economy, which is uh, responding to those environmental issues, um, which we'll come back to. Uh, you get the digital economy, which is how you use technology to solve some of these big problems we face, and the well-being economy issues. And so in each of these areas, you get pathways to innovation. So you get 
innovation that makes us more secure, responding to corruption that makes us more uh, shared in response to disparity, more sustainable in response to degradation, more uh, smart in response to disconnection, and more satisfied in response to discontent. So this is the broad um, framework of integrated value. There's a whole other piece which is about how you implement it, and there are seven steps to implementation, uh, which I won't go through now. Um, so you can see there also, leading to the second part, that circular economy is, I think, at least one of five key pieces to the puzzle. Quite simply, uh, uh, and this is why I did the documentary, unless we implement the circular economy, almost everything else we do around sustainability will come to nothing because everybody wants to continue to grow whole economies and political careers and, and business careers are based on the idea that we have to continue to grow. And that just doesn't work at a finite and planet limited resources unless we close the loop on those processes and uh, materials are, are continuously being reused, being recycled, or going back to nature harvesting. And so the documentary, which is the world's first feature-length documentary, uh, 90 minutes on circular economy, was really me setting out on a journey to explore where are the solutions, uh, who's uh, taking this idea and implementing it, but not in the usual places. So rather than America, I went to Latin America, to South America. Uh, I went to Africa, uh, we did also film in Europe, uh, and documentaries about featuring those examples. And uh, it's done very well, and uh, people seem to, seem to really like the fact that it's not an inclusive agenda, it's not for rich folks in, in Europe um, who can afford it, but actually circular economy can be implemented by communities all around the world, rich or poor, and in whatever culture they make. So let me pause there. That was quite a long explanation. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's, uh, I think um, you've very powerfully summarized some very influential I ideas. Um, I think one purpose of, of having this conversation, also if we keep in mind that the, this is a video for um, young professionals, but also young uh, aspiring researchers, what you presented is a really great framework that um, sounds so simple and, and elegant, um, but I'm imagining the process of, of getting there uh, may a bit of slight messier um, than, than what you've just discussed. Could, could you maybe just tell me a little bit more about um, about that process of, 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 of coming to, to get these, these two kind of ideas together that it's almost a it's counterpoints in a way. Um, it'd, be, it'd be really interesting to learn more about that. I think it's a really interesting question because what academics or researchers do is to synthesize what they're learning along the journey and some of what they learn is perhaps coming from practice like in my case with uh, working for cap gemini you know they had a business transformation model so the idea of needing to be transformative which is a thread through all of my work already was coming out there or at kpmg perhaps it was the opposite dealing with a lot of big clients i i saw how incremental everything was and so i was quite frustrated and, and therefore also even more keen to, to look at transformation. Um, but then it can also be ideas that get picked up. So I was very interested early on in the concept of systems thinking, or at least what we call that today. Uh, I came across it framed as holism because uh, one of our former prime ministers in South Africa wrote a book in 1926 called Holism and Evolution, which was some of the first um, framing of this this theory of systems thinking and, and that's come on a long way since and now we get leaders like uh, Fridjof Capra writing on this uh, and, and many others and it's so essential now to, to sustainability it's it's the essence of how we're interconnected uh, as, as uh, ecological and social and economic systems 
and how we create unintended consequences and so on. So these threads you pick up along the way and um, and try to weave them in a, in a way that makes sense, as I did first with CSR 2.0, and you could test that out as you go. So uh, that went through several iterations in trying to express what I was uh, wanting to, to communicate. And I ended up with five stages of CSR, which was a useful way for me to explain uh, all the different companies I've come across in, in my travels to more than 70 countries now who are at very different stages of implementing CSR. And then the five principles of CSR 2.0 as well, which was a way to sort of test whether companies were uh, at an early stage or immature or actually getting to transformational. Uh, the same with integrated value. It's trying to pull all those threads together. It's trying to, to use the system's thinking, but it's taking into account also what else is going on uh, in, in academia. I mentioned all the different kinds of value that have started to pop up and, and be put forward, uh, all the different standards that have emerged. There are 450 sustainability standards in the world today, but they're all talking about integration. Um, and then sometimes it's just having moments of deep reflection. So I do remember, I think I was somewhere in Germany uh, at, at some event uh, speaking at, and I had half a day and I was just walking through a forest and just really trying to puzzle out, you know, what what is the new set of principles? How could I distill uh, this into something? And at that stage, I, I came up with the five uh, um, components of what I call future fitness, um, which are today what I call the five pathways to, to innovation, the, the shared, smart, secure, sustainable, and satisfying, and so on. Um, and there as well, you have to adapt because what happened is uh, a standard emerged called the Future Fit Benchmark, totally independently from me coming up with the concept of Future Fit. And I just thought, well, I don't want to be competing with this and it's going to be confusing. So let me, again, find a different label to express the same idea and go deeper. And that became integrated value. So it's very much, yeah, it's, it, as you say, it can be a messy or at least a, an entangled and a chaotic process in a very good way because that's, that's how new ideas are born and that's how knowledge is built. Thanks. I really liked your description of how, um, yeah, it's almost these serendipitous encounters of being open to to anything and, and taking the time to reflect on, on what's happened, as well as reading and not um, uh, not forgetting the past, not dis, um, doing disservice to the past, I guess, because there's, a, you know, old ideas are, can be uh, very relevant. I guess I have two follow-up questions to this. Um, the one is... Um, Really, what you've just described, there's, uh, I think, in the, in the beginning when you described uh, the model around integrated value is that uh, you, you just described as, uh, an area of CSR, which is, is under constant evolution in terms of ideas. And, and there's constantly new principles, uh, new frameworks that are being developed. How does one navigate that uh, and how... Uh, how does one work with with that that kind of um, big pot of ideas in a way that's uh, constructive and and uh, and that allows for a greater coordination between people that have different ideas? Yeah, I mean, I must say that both academics and consultants are a bit guilty of of inventing new jargon and new models and new framing framings of things sometimes you would say maybe that's not necessary. So there aren't that many new ideas in the world. So many ideas are very old, but somehow to keep it contemporary, to keep it on, on the agenda, we need to uh, to adjust and to evolve and to to find new language or, or new perspectives on, on things. Um, and so the navigation, I think, partly comes from experience. But I do believe that trying to distill for yourself uh, what you believe or what you uh, have found in your research or in your experience into principles, that really helps. Because for me now, uh, after 30 years in this game, it's pretty easy for me to look at a piece of research or 
uh, or at a, a company uh, professing and claiming certain things and to judge pretty quickly whether this is something really new or whether this is uh, an old idea dressed up uh, and in fact whether it's even what they're claiming that it is. Uh, so principles act like a sort of litmus test to say, you know, is, is this a new idea or is this an old idea? Shared value is a great example. I mean, uh, yes, it was Michael Porter and he has a great uh, following. He's a Harvard professor. Um, but that, that concept has been so heavily criticized for containing actually nothing new and for characterizing all the things that he, he sort of uh, disparages uh, inaccurately. So, no, I think it's that's part of it, is to try to have a filter for the noise. And normally a filter is a set of, of principles or guidelines for yourself. Uh, some of it comes from experience, but some of it you can borrow from others. So you, you, you come across certain pieces of research which actually do it for you. And I'll just give you one example. Um, there's a methodology or a framework called the natural step, which has four systems conditions for sustainability. It was developed by a Swedish uh, cancer researcher, actually. And um, I came across that fairly early on. I actually helped to bring that method out to, to South Africa. But it's, it's the kind of thing that I've now used uh, throughout my career. And you get others like the planetary boundaries or the donut economics. So you, you get these ideas that others actually give to you. So it doesn't all have to be your own invention. Um, we, I mean, academia is, you know, uh, kind of building on others' shoulders. That's what it's about. We're just going to move to our, uh, that was a, um, your final comments, Wayne, were a, a great segue to the final section uh, in terms of uh, outlook. Uh, this uh, in this section we typically focus on advice uh, that you would want to give to uh, future researchers and future academics, um, but specifically because you uh, are what you term as being a pro-academic, working with you know in between uh, academia and the business community. Um, I'm also wondering if you could be really clear uh, in terms of advice about how. Um, how researchers and young professionals can make the most impact with their study choices and their, and their research choices, uh, first of all. Yeah, I think it's uh, really important for, for researchers, if they're interested in making an impact, not just through ideas, but through uh, application, is, is to always just orient their re research towards applied research. So that means, uh, you know, choosing to work with companies uh, in doing the researches, either either as case studies or in terms of the surveys that get done and so on. Sometimes you can structure it even uh, more than that. So at Antwerp Management School, for example, my sustainable transformation lab, we've, we've set up corporate leadership groups, one on circular economy and one on well-being economy where we work with companies to try to have an impact. And we support that with research, but it's also about uh, distilling it into, into actions. Uh, we've come up with a circular economy commitment that companies can sign up to. Uh, we, we're launching that early next year. Uh, and for the well-being, we've come up with a set of principles called the good work goals. So it's just a choice really that you make to, uh, to to use the applied research uh, approach when you're you're going navigating through your career, um, there is a broader point, which is you know how do you make an impact? And part of my interest is uh, linked to systems thinking is in the phenomenon of emergence. Uh, in fact, the book I'm working on now is called The Age of Emergence, and Without going into too much detail, if you look at uh, what happens in nature and in society, there's a lot of self-organization that goes on. If you look at a termite colony of ants, there is no leader, but they do very complex things. They 
go looking for food. They have an area where they bury their dead. They have an area they take out the trash. They feed the queen. They actually do farming underground with with uh, mushrooms. <laughs> so lots of complex things happening with um, with no leader. And when you study emergence, there are a couple of basic uh, rules that you can distill. And the one that I just want to leave you with is all of this happens through local action and through local communication. So whenever you're in a system that's highly interconnected, which is what we're in today, I mean, the economy, the society, the technology, it's all so interconnected, even the ecology, that you can't help but influence the system. And so I would say don't spend too much time worrying about whether you're having a big impact or you know changing the world. What you need to focus on is having an impact where you are. So just among the spheres of in- influence that you have, and that could be in the, in the university or the management school that you're in or in the organization working for the sector, uh, it doesn't matter. You know, the thing with complex systems is you never know also what's going to cause the tipping point. The small action, the proverbial butterfly's wings that will cause a tsunami on the other side of the world. You know, we're so finely tuned in this world today that every action uh, has an impact on the whole system. And when we get um, those actions accumulating, then the whole system can change. And in fact, some research that's been done on what is the percentage of people that need to move in a certain direction or agree on a certain idea to change the whole system, it's something between 5 and 25%. So it's it's not the majority. And those actions don't even have to be coordinated. It's just people who are moving in a similar direction. So my advice really is to is to be passionate about something um, to find something that really interests you and then just, you know, make your impact where you are in whatever way works best for you. You, you may enjoy writing papers, you may enjoy teaching, you may enjoy um, another form of action. Uh, it doesn't matter because it all adds up and at the end of the day it helps us to change the world. And I wrote a poem about that which I might end with if you will indulge me. We'd, we'd love that. It's the perfect way to, to close. <clears throat> I just need some water and then I'll do that. Let me find it. So in the end, uh, I think we're all challenged to change the world. But what does that mean? Uh, sometimes we can use creativity to express that. So I'm going to just share with you in parting a little poem I wrote called Change the World. Let's change the world. Let's shift it. Let's shake it and remake it. Let's rearrange the pieces, the patterns in the maze, the reasons for our days in ways that make it better, in shades that make it brighter, that make the burden lighter because it's shared, because we dared to dream and then to sweat it, to make our mark and not regret it. Let's plant a seed and humbly say, I changed the world today. Let's change the world, let's lift it. Let's take it and awake it. Let's challenge every leader, the citadels of power, the prisoners in the tower, the hour of needs upon us. It's time to raise our voices, to stand up for our choices, because it's right because we fight for all that's just and fair, for a planet we can share. Let's join the cause and boldly say, we'll change the world today. Let's change the world, let's love it. Let's hold it and unfold it. Let's redesign the future, the fate of earth and sky, the existential why. Let's fly to where there's hope, to where the world is greener, where air and water's cleaner. Because it's smart to make a start to fix what we have broken, our children's wish unspoken. Let's be the ones who rise and say, we changed the world today. 
Thank you so much, and, and definitely uh, uh, a very inspirational example of how a small action uh, can create a big change. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Fisher. It's uh, really an honor to speak with you.